hockey has a great history of father-son teams. Well, I found us a father-son referee team. Sam Sisko here was a IHL referee for nearly two decades. He was an NHL supervisor. This is his son, Ross. He was also an IHL referee. He now supervises for the OHL and for the CIS. So we're going to talk a little bit about their careers and what they saw. I'm sure Sam's got a story or two about the old IHL from the 70s. That, uh, can you remember something? Start with you, Sam. Like your career. When did you uh, begin officiating? How did you become one? I guess basically. Well, actually, uh, I wasn't uh, refereeing. wasn't my career. I was a high school teacher. Uh, but Windsor has all kinds of hockey. They're involved in the OHL, the OHA. Uh, the IHL actually had four teams here in the Windsor area before it expanded to Michigan and Illinois and Fort Wayne. Uh, but uh, there were a lot of old-time hockey referees here and one referee named Fred Blackburn asked me if I wanted to referee in the IHL. So I said, well, I'll give it a try. At that time, the game fee in the IHL was $35. <laughs> Not much considering if you got assigned to Muskegon, Michigan. 200 miles. <laughs> you drove to Grand Rapids, from Windsor to Grand Rapids, you were okay. As soon as you got to Grand Rapids, snowstorm. <laughs> For $35, why am I doing this? Because I love the game of hockey. But I did have a very good career in the IHL. And because of my refereeing in the IHL, when I retired from high school teaching, John McCauley asked me, Wes McCauley's dad, John McCauley, who was, he was a terrific referee too. I imagine you people saw John referee. John asked me if I would come aboard and work with the young officials in the NHL. I said, I'd love it. That was in 91. And I had a, a wonderful 10-year career with the NHL from 91 to 2001. Uh, I had some great series. Uh, I see some San Jose uh, sweaters here. I don't know if you want to hear uh, about a San Jose series or uh, uh, if you want to hear uh, about what's wrong with the NHL, <laughs> I, I don't know. No, we have got three days. I, I think that the NHL referees are the best. You can't find better. I called God and I, one day and I said, God, do you have a, any perfect referees up there? He said, no. He said, no, Sam, I don't. I said, well, God, tell the NHL that. <laughs> uh, Paul Stewart's stories. <laughs> I was, Bob and I were talking about it. When Paul was a player, he liked to fight. He played for Cincinnati, by the way. He was in three fights one game. His teammates didn't help him. After the game, he showered with the opposing team. <laughs> Another time in uh, San Jose, and he got into a lot of trouble on this. They had the uh, shoot for a car. If you put it in a little hole in the, <laughs> the board and the goal, you got a car. Well, this person shot, and the puck stopped right on the goal line. <laughs> so they wanted a ruling. They called Paul, he was refereeing the game. They called Paul out. 
Paul came out, pushed the puck in the net, and said, Go. <laughs> of course, the dealership didn't like having that. <laughs> yeah, that insurance is cheap. <laughs> but, uh, you know this uh, San Jose series where they scored four goals on the five minute? Yes. Okay, I had a series between LA and St. Louis. This was in either 1995 or 97. I'm not sure, 95, 96, or 97. LA's leading 3 nothing with less than 10 minutes to go. St. Louis shoots the puck into the LA zone. Jeff Cortnell, playing for St. Louis, skates up the ice and the goalie for LA was Jamie Storr, who by the way played for the Windsor Spitfires here a few years ago. And Courtnell, you knew his reputation. He knocked, he knocked uh, Store over. Well, o o o O'Donnell, big big defenseman for L.A. I see an L.A. guy nodding his head. He said, "Hey, they're not getting away." He attacked Courtnell and beat the heck out of him. Koharski's the referee. He had no alternative. So you, some of you referees know what the call would be. Well, here's what the call was. Courtnell got two minutes for goaltender interference. O'Donnell got two for instigating at that time, five for fighting, and a game misconduct. Five minutes power play. St. Louis has got Brett Hall, uh, Adam, Oates. Adam Oates, and some other good, real good players. They scored four goals in the, just like San Jose did. Four goals while Larry Robinson, the coach of LA, he was upset. But I think he, he should have called a timeout and talked to Storr because Storr was shook up. And the GM of uh, LA wants to talk to Koharski. Don says, no, I'm not going to talk to him. He's irate and you can't blame him. So he came and asked me, what do you think? I says, the right call was made. O'Donnell had no business. He should have maybe went and give him one shot, but not to the extent where he deserved the two, the five, and the game. So, anyway, I'll let my son Ross. Sam, Sam, before you give up the floor, I missed your introduction, but I'd like to hear about your start in refereeing and and uh, how I wish you got into refereeing. You must have been a player to start with. I'm sorry, would you go over that again? I, I missed your introduction, so I was just wondering if you talked about your own career as a referee and, and how you got into it. Well, I refereed uh, OHA hockey at the time. I worked as a linesman and I refereed minor hockey in the Windsor area. And I liked it, and the OHA at the time, uh, there were a number of Windsor teams in the OHA, and I enjoyed it, and I also enjoyed the teaching, but I was, uh, that's how I got started. And I guess this, a few of the old time referees thought I was doing a good job and asked me if I would like to. How many years in the IHL? 18. 18. And how tough was that league? <clears throat> Very tough. At one time, somebody, we were talking about how the NHL has very little fighting now. 
Well, the IHL had plenty of fight. <laughs> I would look at the, they would bring in the card for the starting lineup. I'd look at, uh oh, the guys, I'd tell the linesman, be alert. At the drop of the puck, we got a five on five brawl. <laughs> I lost control, they said. <laughs> it's always the referees. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. I don't know. Uh, uh, do you know anything about Willie Marshall? <laughs> Willie Marshall. The player? The guy that Don Cherry and Howie Meeker said was screwed by the NHL. He was what? Screwed. Screwed? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, do you know I, the story? I'm not aware of it. Oh, God. He, he, uh, the trophy's named after him. He, what, he got the most points. The most assists in American hockey. He, he was banned from the NHL. Well, I can tell a Don Cherry story where he cost the Bruins uh, a game. Montreal. Against Montreal. I was there. John D'Amico, a good friend of mine who passed away, uh, was the linesman at the time. Boston had too many men on the ice. And D'Amico was yelling, Don, Don, get him up. He's, D'Amico told me he gave him nine seconds. <laughs> Finally, he had to call Boston for too many men on the ice. Montreal went on to score the winning goal on the power play. I think it was Guy Lafleur. So, Don Cherry is not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> he's funny, but he's not perfect. How about Howie Meeker? Uh, Howie Meeker. <laughs> Still alive. Yeah. I like him. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. And with a father son duo like yourselves, uh, in the old Eastern Hockey League, we had a father son duo of uh, the Suscos. S U C C I O. <laughs> I punched one of them out accidentally in the game and got myself a little trouble. No, I worked a lot of uh, game sevens in the IHL, and so I uh, I had a real good career in the IHL. How much did you interact with the coaches? Like the story you told. Where they, were trying, where they were talking to Don to get a player off. Would you interact with the, the coach while you were on the ice? Coaches. <laughs> I had a lot of, in the IHL, we had a lot of character coaches. A lot of Don Cherries. <laughs> there was a, I don't know if there are any Toledo people here. But Gold Ted team? Garvin coached oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Toledo. They had a number, number of different names. Was John Brophy there? No, no, John was uh, not in Toledo, but he was. I didn't do many of his games, but he this this Garvin guy was quite a character. One night, he took off his sport coat, took off shirt and he's got a Superman. <laughs> of course I gotta throw him out of the game. He goes up, gets the PA, goes up to the uh, thing and announces that this is my last, this is San Cisco's last game. <laughs> That's the kind of thing I put up with. I, I was really upset that, that the next day I told Commissioner of the League I was through. They talked me out of it. You know what they fined Garvin? Fifty dollars. Peanuts. There you go. <laughs> Gus Kyle, uh, the name's familiar, but I didn't have it. I know he coached in several other leagues. I didn't know if he coached in the 
Any other questions? Okay, I let my son take over. Before I introduce Ross, I have to tell my Don Koharski story since Sam brought him up. We all know what, unfortunately, what Don did from the floor, the, the donut incident. <laughs> well, in 2016, I was bought out by the Windsor Star. And that has no relevance to this story other than the fact that the other writers that covered the wings, one of the writer's wives owned a bakery. So he got her to make a cake for my final game. So I get on the elevator with this cake, where I figure I'll bring it up to the press box and slice it up there and give everybody in the press box a piece of cake. So who happens to be the NHL supervisor on duty at that game? Don Koharski. Who's on the elevator next to me going up to the press box? Don Koharski. Who's eyeing the cake like it's a gold medal in the old press box? He says, can I get me some of that cake? <laughs> Sure can, Doc. <laughs> and I thought for a moment, you know, this would make a real funny tweet, and I thought, I can't do that. <laughs> but he did get a big piece of cake, and he was very happy. <laughs> as Sam mentioned, he was a school teacher. Ross was also a school teacher as well as a, a referee. And uh, how many years were you in the refereeing game on the ice? Uh, probably 15 years. Brought up before. <laughs> Before I uh, let Ross talk, as a teacher, I had the pleasure of teaching Pete DeBoer, who now, of course, is the coach of San Jose, Adam Graves, who was the nicest kid you would ever, any Ranger people here? So <laughs> Rangers, I saw the Ranger shirt, Adam <laughs> Graves played for the Rangers. <laughs> Darren Shannon played for Winnipeg. Okay, there's no Winnipeg jerseys here. No. When I uh, worked for the NHL, Winnipeg was in the IHL. Okay, then they, of, of course, got into the NHL. But I, I had the pleasure of. I also taught uh, the coach of Florida, Bob Boogner. Bob Boogner. Yeah. So, both as a teacher and a referee, I had the pleasure of meeting a lot of people in hockey. What did you teach? I taught calculus. I taught math. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, I'm a French teacher, so oh. I have to ask you what you taught. <laughs> What's that? I teach French, so I was going to ask you. What well, you when I first started teaching, I taught Latin. <laughs> hey, that's how, that's how old I am. <laughs> What'd you teach? And I retired before Ross. <laughs> <laughs> My dad and I have very similar like uh, lives. Uh, I was a teacher for 31 years. I refereed very similar to my dad. On the weekends, I would get in the car and travel to a lot of the former rinks that he used to referee in. I often got, your dad would be really disappointed in you. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of players my dad refereed ended up being coaches in the IHL who would just give me a little bit of a hard time. But coaches have short memories. I found after some games they hated you, when you walked into the rink the, the next game, you were the best friend. They just wanted to talk with you. And that's the, the great thing about hockey players. They have very short memories. Uh, seriously, I, I just found that you know, you'd be afraid to go into a rink sometimes and the coach would be talking to you before the game comes, a cucumber, telling you, you know what, forget what I said last time, and get pressure from the GM, you know, we're not winning. Uh, I got to take it on somebody and say, okay, and it was all good that way. But uh, yeah, I, I, very similar to my dad, teacher, referee on the weekends. Uh, fortunately, a lot of the, the leagues were around here. The Detroit Vipers played in the IHL, which was before 9-11. It was a 45 minute ride I could actually teach a full day of school, go home, have a little nap, have supper, get in the car around quarter six, get to the uh, rink by quarter to seven, and referee an IHL game. And at that time, they were the farm team of the Tampa Bay Lightning. So it wasn't uh, uncommon to see a guy playing for the Vipers on a Friday night, and then maybe turn on hockey night in Canada, 
on the weekend and see a, a guy a great collection of jerseys from the IHL because I used to keep my ear close to the ground. You hear about a, a guy getting, this guy's getting called up to Tampa Bay on the weekend. So in warm-ups, I'd go to the guy, hey, what are you doing with your jersey? <laughs> the guy said, I don't know. I go, send it down to the referee's room. So I, I was the best dress pickup player in the hockey <laughs> out there. Uh, but my story about refereeing was I did a lot of minor hockey because I thought it was so cool. To, I used to go watch my dad. I was a big Fort Wayne Comets fan. I remember one time him coming off the ice in Fort Wayne. I kicked him in the shins because he gave Fort Wayne a penalty late. I was so, <laughs> so mad at him. But I remember sleeping in the back of his car, going back and forth to Fort Wayne and Toledo, and just loving the referee and how like, I loved the, the excitement about it. So I did a lot of minor hockey, but then I had a growth spurt. And I, I got into basketball, into university basketball. But all the time, I still enjoyed going to watch my dad referee hockey. So a few of the guys were saying, you should, you should come in and work as a referee. I'm like, nah, guys, I do not want to get in there. That, that's too fast. You guys are breaking up fights. I don't want any part of that. Now you're, you're, you're going to come to training camp. I says, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I see that there's blood, there's, there's pucks that are buzzing by your head to go, you're doing it. You're a good skater. You're gonna, so they invited me to the UHL training camp in Flint, Michigan. Uh, so I went to this camp kind of reluctantly. I said, you know what, to honor my dad, I'm going to give it a shot. So I went to this UHL training camp in Flint, Michigan, and as a treat, on a Friday night, they took us to a Detroit Vipers Cleveland Lumberjacks game. That was our treat, <coughs> because you guys can go see how the pros do it. So we went as guests of the UHL, of the, of the IHL, and we're sitting in the crowd watching this IHL game, and like, we're all going like, oh God, this is amazing. Well, in between the first and second period, I went down to talk to the referees, who I knew through being involved in the IHL, watching them all those years. And one of the linesmen, he's, he's, he's doing this with his leg in the corner. He says, I, I don't know if I can go on. And uh, I said, well, I, 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 I'm down here for a training camp. I got my stuff in the car. He says, go get it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, he goes, go get your stuff. So I went to my truck, I went and got my stuff, I went and got dressed really quickly. I went and did the second and third periods of an IHL game. I'd never done a pro game in my life before. My eyes were this big. The first fight, I'd never been that close to a fight. And to hear the knuckles hitting the chins and the faces and the crowd going nuts, I'm going, what am I doing here? <laughs> I hope no one had video of it, but I got in there, I broke it up, and it's amazing how quickly they break up. Like, they're not like <coughs> junior players where they try to get an extra punch in. I was amazed that after beating the heck out of each other, they pat each other, good job, good job. And they're, yeah, good job, good job. <laughs> I got blood on my jersey, and I'm going, I can't, I can't believe this. So I did the second and third period, and I'm, I'm dropping the puck, it had to be shaken. <laughs> the player, a few players said, hey kid, relax. And I'm going, so I dropped the puck, game's over. Get back to the bar that we met at, and uh, the guys are all talking and drinking after the game. They're going, that was pretty cool, eh? They go, where'd you take off to? <laughs> I said, I did the second and third period. <laughs> they said, right. I went, oh, guys, Pat Dunn got hurt. I filled in for him in the second and third period. They go, we didn't even notice you. My dad often said, you do a good job as a referee if no one notices you. I said, you didn't notice me at all? He says, no. I said, I must have done well. <laughs> and that gave me the confidence to say that I, I can do this. And I was just in the right place at the right time. What turned out, I guess, during the second and third period, because a lot of guys didn't, still didn't know about me doing the game, at camp the next day, the commissioner from the UHL came in. He was livid. <laughs> he says, you guys, no class. You, 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 you disgraced our league yesterday. You guys were guests of the IHL. I look up, and you guys all got beer in your hands. He goes, referees shouldn't be seen drinking alcohol at a, at a, at a hockey game. It's taboo. You, you should have been there watching the game be professional. Says, the only guy in this room that shouldn't be ashamed of himself is Cisco, because he was on the ice doing the game. And they're going, was you out there? But that's how it, it all, uh, it, it just took off. and. I called my dad and said, Dad, you'll never guess what happened on the weekend. He was proud, and I thought, 
I can do this. And I got assigned to a, a game in Port Huron, uh, an exhibition game. I did well. And I got initiated back in the days when you could uh, initiate referees. Dave Cassidy, I don't know if you've ever heard that name before, he put Vaseline in my helmet. <laughs> so I put it on. It's like, this thing feels weird. He put shampoo in my whistle. <laughs> and I went to blow my first whistle, my first offside. It works well. Bubbles were everywhere. <laughs> the guys there, it's offside, it's offside. Going, my whistle's not working. I blow it, there's more bubbles coming off. <laughs> he made me go up to the he made me go up to the Kalamazoo coach and say, go give the ref, go give the coach a two-minute warning. Oh. I said, nice. and I knew my rules. I says, well, what do you mean? He says, in the IHL is a, in the OHL, in the IHL is a two-minute warning every period. <laughs> he says, listen, rookie, go to the coach, Larry Playfair, he says, and go up to him and tell him there's two minutes left in the period. So I skate towards the bench and go, uh, Coach Playfair, there's two minutes left in the period. Him and Cassie were in goes, what do you mean? I, I don't care if there's two minutes left. Let's hit the NFL, you rookie. And he was just berating me. And I'm just sitting there taking it. I go, and you and Cassidy, and Cassidy's sitting there laughing his head off. But uh, those are the things you remember. You remember the game. And uh, I remember speaking of video replay, one of the very first games I did, you always taught me hustle. You know, if you're in the right position, no one can ever question you. They will. They'll attempt to. But if you can be in the right position, it's really going to add to your credibility as a referee or a linesman. So one of my first games ever, I get there, and either the referee or the linesman will talk to me. They just, I walk in the dressing room, and I don't know, that's the way they initiate me. They just, hi, I'm Ross Disco. And you're like, <laughs> So I'm going, this is, this is nice. What an introduction to this. Early in the game, I'm covering the, the referee. This is back in the days of the three referee system. Where the linesman often had to skate in and cover the net. The referee was caught up. Well, a guy makes a, a shot and the goalie catches the puck, but his, his glove is clearly behind the goal post. It's in the net. Well, the home crowd is going nuts. Great save. And I point like this. <laughs> And the referee says, what the hell are you doing pointing? I, 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 when the goalie makes the save, I went, well, the puck was behind the goal post when he made the save. He says, you're telling me that's a goal? I went, yeah, it was a goal. And uh, he said, you're going to kill me here. <laughs> he says, this crowd's going to go nuts right now. When I go report a goal, there, are you 100% sure? And I says, my dad taught me the right thing. He says, be in position, and you're going to sell the call. And he knew where I was right on the goal line. I pointed, I hustled, and he went and reported a goal while the coach was just ripping on me. Just, who the hell are you? You're rookie, you've never seen you before. You're trying to make a name for yourself. Back to how, like, once again, how the times have changed. You could say things more to refer to coaches and players back in the day. Now, with all the video and people having cameras, they'll, They'll put it on YouTube and say, look what this referee said to this guy, and the referee might get suspended. But back in those days, you could give it back to them <laughs> without any repercussion. So I'm sitting by this bench, and this coach and this team is ripping me to shreds, and they're calling me everything in the book. And I don't know if it was my gift of gab or whatever. I said, yeah, guys, you're right. This bench... 200 feet away is a much better angle than the one I had 10 feet from the net. I should, in fact, I'll tell you what, guys. For the rest of this game, any time I want to make a call, I'm going to come over and check with you guys. How's that sound? Well, F-bombs directed at me. I learned pretty quickly that that doesn't make you enemies. When you start trying to show up the coach in front of the players, or you start showing, trying to show up a player in front of the other players, so I just learned to shut my mouth. <laughs> but uh, it felt good, though. It, it is, uh, <laughs> to, give, to give it back to the players once in a while. Anyways, uh, I ended up teaching for 31 years. I was fortunate enough to do a, a lot of games in Detroit, and I, uh, I flew all over the states. A few games I was mic'd, uh, and my students, when I got to school, 
The next morning would say things like, Sir, we saw you on TV last night. Oh, yeah. Sir, uh, you swear a lot. <laughs> I said, boys and girls, there's a hockey Mr. Cisco and there's a referee Mr. Cisco. You're hearing the referee Mr. Cisco. I said, but a lot of that swearing is the, the guys giving it to me. No, no, sir, it was your voice. We heard it. We heard it. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of a nice... Uh, my dad was my boss in the IHL, actually. He was the uh, vice president of the IHL. For was, two years. For two years, yeah. So that was, that was nice. And a lot of people did say, you're only there because you're dead. And my answer was, you're right. <laughs> you're right. My dad opened the door for me. Uh, my, name, my dad's name opened the door for me. He's opened many doors for me. But once I got in the door, I had to perform. I said, if I was bad, it wouldn't have taken long. And I held on for a long time. And uh, I still carry my, my last name proudly uh, because of this man here. And he set a great example for me. And he said, it's opened a lot of doors for me. And uh, every time I think about carrying myself properly on the ice, I think of what would dad do. One of, my, one of the best things about Dad is we would say to him, we discuss hockey a lot. His, one of his favorite sayings is, uh, you got to use common sense. Okay? Because a lot of referees, they'll referee by the book. Right? A trip is a trip is a trip. Trip in the first period is a trip in the third period. Well, you guys all know, and ladies all know, that sometimes a hold or an interference in period three with two minutes to go in a tie game it's going to be let go as opposed to a, a hold early on a game where a referee's trying to set a precedent. So oftentimes if we make a call, my dad would say, you know, you got to use common sense. And then sometimes when we use common sense, my dad would say, well, what's the rule book say? <laughs> <laughs> so we we're never going to win an argument with him. He's always going to have a, a good comeback. But he was a great teacher and to this day we still talk about hockey and my mother had a had a you know st a stroke almost seven years ago, eh? And it's, it's affected my dad, and he's it's definitely taken a toll on him. But when you get him talking about hockey, as you saw tonight, the life comes right back into him, eh? And I'm, I'm just sitting here going, "This is Bob. Thank you so much for providing this opportunity for him. He's like, this is something that you really deserved and you really enjoyed tonight." Huh? But any questions, uh, comments? Yes, sir. Qu question. What was the difference between coaching in the IHL and and, Reffing. and doing AHL or NHL games? The guys that graduate, are they faster or are they... Good question. I just answered this to my daughter yesterday because we were watching hockey. I asked a player who had been up and down. I said, what's the difference between playing in an NHL game and an AHL game? An NHL game and an AHL game or an IHL game? He says, in the IHL, when you make a mistake, sometimes you can cover or a team will cover. If you make a mistake in the National Hockey League, the puck's ending up in the back of your net, or your goalie's going to have to make one heck of a save to bail you out. He said, that's how quickly it happens. Here, he says, in the IHL, you turn it over. Sometimes the guy you're turning it over might be, you know, not break, not be able to break into the open and get a clean shot. In the NHL, you're going to pay for it. Your mistakes a lot, a lot more. Uh, it's such a Small difference though, like you look at some guys, you go, why is that guy not in the NHL? Sometimes it's, a, it's an attitudinal thing. Not a good team player, not a, not a right place, right time. Some teams, some farm teams, the team above, the NHL teams, at, at his position, they're, they're already strong there. Okay. What about for on ice officials? What, like, was it a consideration for you to? To go further, I know you had a full-time job. So. Uh, I don't think I was that in, with a three-man system at the time when I was doing it. I don't think I was a good enough skater. Now with four referees, I could have done it. Yeah, but it was a decision, I had a lifestyle decision. But in terms of skating ability, judgment, like I have, I think I have really good judgment. I'm a good communicator. But at the time, it was three refer one referee skating the whole ice with two linesmen. And the physical thing, too. Like I, I just think I was a little bit slow and maybe not as big as I should have been to, to do it at that level there. Ross, uh, 
Now the NHL is, is hiring a lot of ex-players mm -hmm. and, and wanting to make them officials. At one time, it was you graduated from the OHL or the OHA, and if you were really good, you went to the uh, IHL, then you went to the American League, and then the NHL. But now they are hiring a lot of ex-players. That's they've changed their philosophy. I did a couple. I did a Carolina Buffalo preseason game. I did a Red Wing game one time. It's 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 so easy in terms of the flow. Like they're so predictable. Uh, the off, there's very few offsides. Like you just you, everything's done so smoothly. It's done so quickly, efficiently, but it's fast. It's, it's fast, and it's, the shots come. Uh, you've got to give them the boards. Like if you're a linesman on the boards, you've got to be very you know give them that two feet off the boards. But they're not just going to turn blindly and fire it like they. They're strong. They they uh, they got great hands. They shoot the puck a little bit harder than the, uh, the minor pro guys. They're a little bit bigger. But Sean Avery, like Sean, when the NHL was on strike oh, one year, the number of NHL players came to play in the United Hockey League. Brian Smolinski, Chris Chelios, uh, Darian Hatcher, very professional. Sean Avery. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable, unbelievable. Chris Chellers had to babysit him. I actually said, Chris, can you come and get him away from me? Like he's just, just ornery, ignorant. You know, the minor league players were, he was trash talking minor league players. You know, like Chelios and Smolinski and Hatcher, they were helping these guys, you know, be role models, showing this is what a pro looks like. Avery was just hard to deal with. Awesome. Yeah. Well, my friend from Boston. Uh, uh, have you heard anything about uh, women as officials coming soon to pro hockey? Have you guys heard about well, any? I referee uh, the Ontario Women's Hockey Association. I was doing that for a number of years. Uh, I think the women, more are stepping up, but we really are having a difficult time with the confidence level of a lot of the young girls. I, I, I got away from the women's hockey I said, I'm getting out of the way. And I encourage some of the other male referees, says, get out of this, let's get out of this women's hockey. Let the women do it, okay? Because all I need to have is an experience like I had in, in Flint that night where they do a game and it's like, I, I can do this. But so many games you go to, like in the, in the PWHL, there's a male referee and two female linesmen. Throw the women in there, let them do it, and they will develop, because you see my, my niece plays for Cornell. Uh, they often have three male referees doing these games. I don't know why there's not more females doing it. I, I don't know about them doing it at the pro level yet, but in terms of judgment, demeanor, I'm sure they would do a fine job. Yeah, I heard whispers of that. And, and like you say, a lot of women are in just as good a shape as the guys. You know? And some of them, my niece skates better than we ever skated, you did. She's well, unbelievable. you can't yeah. say never in the NHL. I mean, they had it. They're they're in the, the NFL. They're in the NBA. Yeah. And are they also in baseball? No, I'm not sure. I can see that. I can see it one day. I have a daughter, so I'm always uh, promoting that. But don't, but don't put them in just so you can say we have a female referee. Right. They have to be well, good enough to do it. I've watched some NBA games. You can't tell who the female referee is out there, and, and you can't you can't go up to referees now and get in their faces and you know you can't you can't get a technical foul. You can get a flag. You can get in sportsman league. So if you prove to your, the, your people that you can do it, by all means, it'd be, it'd be a great thing to see. I think you're going to see more of that. Good question. Yes, sir. <coughs> I'm also. I'm a retired teacher and, and ref 35 years. We talked earlier. It's amazing how on the same page referees are. Like one of the things we talked about, like you go to a hockey game, I'm not watching the players. I'm watching the refs and the lines and what they're doing because that's what I do. 
-hmm. If you've never done this, never repped a game, you know, you have no idea. It's a whole different ball game. And you get up there, things are moving really fast, and what you would call, yeah, but why didn't he do this and why didn't he do that? Well, you're going to get an argument, well, why didn't he do this and the other? You think your call is going to be the right one. Not necessarily, because you're going to piss off half the stands. <laughs> it, it, it just works that way. That statement you also made about breaking up fights. First time I, was in a, I broke up a fight was at a junior A camp. And two guys started throwing them. And what you see on TV, you don't hear a thing. You really don't see a lot. But when you hear those knuckles hitting faces, I broke up a fight one time where a guy broke a guy's nose. Uh, it's not a lot of fun. I've seen a referee in a fight when a player gets pulled down, a skate go right across his wrist. Oh! And the blood squirted from me to you. Oh! The game was canceled in Flint. The players were literally gagging on the ice because, and the player got rushed and he, he was saved. But that's another element of, of hockey where you're thinking, like, there's a lot of potential for something really, really bad to happen in a fight. It's reduced. He's, we were talking earlier with my, another gentleman from Boston here saying how it's still something that's going to happen in sports. You can never say ban fighting, but the penalties will become more severe. They have been becoming. I remember like you were asking a gentleman with the Mississauga shirt there uh, about my dad, uh, you know, was it tough? I remember fearing for my dad's life going to some games because in the old IHL, and for the NHL in a lot of respects too, if it was four to three and a team pulled their goalie and a fifth goal was scored to make it five three and now that game's out of reach, who usually came over the bench at that point? The goons. In the last 30 seconds of some of my dad's games in the IHL took 15, 20 minutes. In Toledo they throw chairs over the over the stands. <laughs> and it was acceptable, right, Dad? It's like Dad was in Toledo tonight, an hour from Windsor. Why did he get home at 2.30 in the morning? <laughs> because the game sheet that had to be filled out took an extra hour, and the last 15 seconds of the game took 45 minutes. And, they ha and that's a weird thing about hockey. You never notice in basketball, or football, when the game's out of reach, players are walking off the court, and there's still time on the clock. I wish they would do that in hockey sometimes. <laughs> I'm serious, when there's 13 seconds to go in a East Coast game and it's six to one, run the clock out, you know? Don't have to drop that puck. What, good, what good's gonna happen in the last 13 seconds of a hockey game sometimes? Run the time, you know? But I used to fear for him sometimes because it was a lot of fighting that went on in that league. Now it's diminished greatly. Yeah. And there was good. a lot of, uh, I mentioned you when you were over here, I, I purchased Bruce Hood's collection. In it, I didn't bring it here, but there was a lot of game reports where you wrote up a lot of guys. And some of the stuff was like unbelievable. You know, we're walking down a hallway with Scotty Bowman. And he actually wrote in a report that he invited Scotty Bowman into the referee's room, which I think we're both looking at each other thinking, not a good idea. But this is Bruce Hood, this is back in the day. And I looked through the, one of the IHO yearbooks I had, and there's Bruce's picture. He was a ref in the IHL back in, in, the, early, uh, in the early 60s. I think he started in the NHL 64, but he was, you know, at that time. Really glad to hear from you guys. Yeah. Yes? Can Don Cherry fight when he played? Did you ever notice or ever heard anything on that? How many shifts in the NHL did Don Cherry play? <laughs> he played one shift in the National Hockey League. Okay. I guess he was tough, right? I guess he was a tough player. No, but he played in the league in yeah. the AHL. In the AHL, he was a tough. He was tough in the AHL. I don't know enough about his career. He talks a mean game. He, listening to him, you're going, man, you were you really patrolled the, the <laughs> ice there, and you uh, because of you, your team won so many Calder Cups. Uh, but I never saw any footage of him playing. But I do believe he was probably a pretty strong player. Well, I can. Uh, can you? Mark Rayon was from LaSalle, just okay. outside of Windsor. <laughs> played many years in the AHL with Don Cherry, and I asked him one time. Is he as tough as he says he is? And Mark just started laughing. 
<laughs> he just laughed. He didn't. He didn't have to answer. He was laughing so hard it was. Well, Bob, you could tell Mark Graham that. Uh, well, I'll take him on uh, any time, and uh, you name the place, and uh, I'll be Mark Graham there. Okay. Call him Mark Graham. He call him. Oh, you tell him Mark Reno guy. Uh, and, uh, I'll take him on anywhere. <laughs> were Were you guys surprised about the IHL when it sort of folded slash merged with the AHL? Could you see that coming at all? Were you there at the time? Yeah, I could see it coming. Yeah, when uh, Bob Buford took over, he tried to fight the NHL. See, the IHL at that time was getting really strong. Chicago, Houston, and San Francisco, Orlando, Vegas. Vegas. The Florida team, they were there were very strong teams. And this Bob Eufer, he tried to fight the NHL and that was the end. But it, it was it was a very good league over fifty years. Mm -hmm. Started right here. First game was at Windsor Arena. Yeah. One of the two leagues that was born in Windsor. The Can Pro League in 1926 played its first game at Windsor Arena, and the IHL in 40. I think it was 46 or 47. I think the first game was in Windsor. It's interesting where it's become, and, and as hockey people, I don't know, depending, depending on how your team's doing, it has to be very frustrating at times because, like, like this, the San Jose game here, and that you're watching that, you're going, how can Four referees not see that hand pass. Okay. Well, in my job as a video goal judge in the Ontario Hockey League, my hands would have been tied on the Wednesday night. Yep. And I've, I've said to people in the higher ups, says, "You got to change the rule. You know, because the rule states that if the puck is hand passed to Bob from me, and Bob shoots it in the net, and the refs don't see it." I can call down and say, listen, uh, Cisco passed, hand passed it to Bob. Bob scored. You guys missed it, but no goal. And the referee, referees would say, no goal. But if I hand pass it to Bob, and Bob then passes it to my dad, who scores, and no one sees it, and I'm in the booth going, oh, geez, they missed that hand pass. But since Bob passed it to another guy, I have to shut my mouth. That's what I don't like about hockey. If the puck hits the netting and no one sees it, and it falls back on the ice, and I shoot it in the net, and no one sees it, as a video goal judge, you can call down and say, hey, listen, guys, the puck hit the net directly to a guy who scored no goal. But if it comes off the net to a guy who then passes it to a teammate who scores, and no one sees it, I have to bite, I have to bite my lip. And I thought, why not extend it a little bit? Why not say, how about two passes? But the concern is, how much power are you going to give the video goal judge? What happens if the puck hits the net, play goes on for three or four minutes, team scores, do you call back down and say, listen, about three minutes ago the puck hit the net? <laughs> so that's the concern. And Brian Burke made a good point. He said, we have to be concerned about the people in the crowd. Do we want to have people sitting in a ring for four hours because everything is being reviewed now? Or do sometimes we simply say, it was missed? And that's where the game is at right now. And as referees, it's embarrassing when you miss something. Okay, in our day, if we missed something, it was debatable, right? The coach might come and say, you screwed that up, you missed that offside. And you say, that's your opinion. I, you know, you're entitled to your opinion. Well, you're brutal. Once again, you're entitled to your opinion. But there was no video evidence of it now, back in our day. Now there's every angle, and they're gonna, and look at, look at uh, one of our good friends. Didn't go on in the NHL playoffs this year because of that cross-check to San Jose. The guy cross-checked him, which was a two-minute cross-check, but the real damage came when the other winger came through and knocked the player Pavelski down, and that's when he hit his head on the ice. 
Well, as referees, when you see blood on the ice, right, you're going, oh, I better call something here. He didn't cut himself. And I did see the original cross check. Did the original cross check cut him? They got together, they talked, they gave him five minutes. Well, you saw what happened in those five minutes. It wasn't very good for Vegas. But that's one that probably should have been reviewed, right? They probably should have said to the referees, take, oh, geez, that's a two minute cross check instead of a five minute major. So I can see the game going to that one day. But how far are we going to allow the video to go into it? Let's be careful what we ask for. I have a question for you people. How many of you refereed? How many in, in here have refereed? Does floor hockey count? Yes. <laughs> yes. You know how tough it is, right? And those four guys missed it. But I think they were honest. They didn't see it. They weren't dishonest. They didn't want San Jose to win. They didn't want uh, St. Louis to lose. They were honest. They have integrity. And that's what refereeing is all about, integrity. And Dan O'Halloran had integrity, let me tell you. One of the best referees in the NHL. You know, when a coach or a player used to come up to you and say, you missed a trip. If you say, no, I didn't, then you, maybe you're not telling the truth. If you say, you might be right. All the fire goes out of that guy. <laughs> okay? You know, that's not personal. He says, you missed a trip. He didn't say, I suck. He didn't say, you're brutal. He said, you missed a trip. I might have. You just don't want to have to say, like my guys say, you don't want to have to say, I might have more than once or twice a game. <laughs> Sometimes you don't want to say it for weeks. <laughs> if every week you're saying you missed something, then maybe you're in the wrong profession. But once in a while you have to say, yeah, from, from where I was standing, I didn't see it that way. There's, there's key lines that get you out of jackpots, okay? And, and when you hang around, when you have a father as a referee, you discuss situations before they happen. So when things happen, sometimes it just clicks in and a lot of dad's lines came to me, okay? A lot of my dad's lines came to me at uh, the right moment. Well, got me out of some predicaments. <laughs> Sir, with the cool uh, hat on, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, look, uh, referees are important. Yes, they and are. They, they have to have all kinds of skills, and mm -hmm. you name it. How do they get paid? We, we well, don't let the players get paid. On the, the, league you're in, the referees. We know nothing managed, about the referees. <clears throat> the NHL referees get paid very well. My dad, uh, he was telling you, get used to getting a vehicle uh, in Windsor, Ontario, drive to Muskegon. I don't know what the, the referees were making. I'm going to guess around eighty or ninety dollars. The lines were getting paid thirty-two dollars. A lot of times they made more money on the travel money. They got paid like twenty-five cents a what mile. What about the NHL? NHL. <laughs> a, a referee who's been doing it for a number of years, probably making three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars. Some reasonable. Yeah, but when when I had to make the decision, do I want? A school teacher or do I want to be an NHL referee the referees in the NHL were not making good money they were making 2,000 a year I would make more as a school teacher that's why I went into teaching and I did refereeing as a sideline if but now the referees are very well paid yeah. too Yes, sir. There's a perception if one team gets three, four penalties in a row, that the next call has to go against the visiting team. I think it's human that, nature. Do you, do you, yeah. feel that, do you ever feel that? It's too? human nature. They often say, like, <coughs> let's say Mississauga has taken four penalties in a row against Windsor. The commentator will say, well, Windsor better uh, watch themselves because the first little thing they do. Now, you're not, you're not saying, i got to make it 4-4. Four, four. But you know in your, in your heart and your brain that, geez, I put that team down for eight minutes now in this period. Uh, I don't want to seem like it's one side. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking at Windsor. Don't be clutching and grabbing. If I can, if I can get one on you, I'm going to get one. I'm not going to make it like cheapy, but you're not going to get away with that little neutral zone hold 
if I'd given Mississauga four penalties in a row. Dad, do you agree with that kind of? You're only as good as your next call. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the coach has said if it's if it's if it's five five and you don't call a penalty, you referee into the score. Yeah, the score's kind of important. Yeah. And what are they gonna say to that? Call the game. Yep, it's five five. I'm calling I'm calling the game. I'm managing it well. Well, uh, you missed one. You're you're probably right. And then then you move on. As long as the coaches are speaking respectfully and they're not standing on the bench pointing at you, okay? A lot of little referee tricks. Sometimes you say to a, a coach uh, who's yelling at you, or you go, to, you go up to a player, okay, and who's incensed about it, you skip to him and say, you see that girl in the third row? And he's looking over your shoulder, he's still looking at it, and you, and you see him nodding his head. Okay? Or, did you guys play in New York last night? And he's doing this, and the, the whole crowd sees him nodding his head. Okay? And the crowd will say, well, it must have been that bad guy. He's, he's, he's agreeing with them. Okay, so there's ways of presenting yourself. Little tricks. Go ask him a question that's going to demand a yes answer. Okay? And then in that conversation, it's like, oh, by the way, you, you see them. Go on YouTube and click on NHL referees mic'd up if you want to get a really good insight as to the banter that goes on between those guys. They're, they're, they're great at it. Yes, sir? Has, have there been uh, rule changes or uh, new rules that at the beginning of the season you thought, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I'm going to have to call this or I'm going to have to enforce this? Uh, Rule changes, Dad, that uh, been in, in, implemented that you're, you've said to yourself, "Oh no, I gotta, I gotta call this now." In minor hockey in Canada, for instance, there's a, a, a head contact rule. Any head contact they want to call, even accidental head contact, they want two minutes. So if you and I are along the boards and we're uh, scrumming for a puck, and my shoulder hits your head, the referee's arm is supposed to go up. Two minutes. Now, remember the old face wash? Yeah. Remember the old, that's, that's intentional head contact. That's supposed to be four minutes. So we tell kids, we don't tell kids, but coaches are telling our kids, if you're mad at a guy, whack him in the ankles with your stick. <laughs> you're getting a two minute slashing penalty. Don't be face washing him, because you're getting four. So we're seeing a lot more stick stuff, now, lower <laughs> stuff, okay? If you hit someone in the head now intentionally, it's intentional head contact, and it's injurious, it's supposed to be a match penalty, you're gone from the game. Like, I love Boston, so do you. <laughs> McAvoy should have been, should have got five minutes for that, according to today's rules. That was a targeting the head, the player was injured, okay? They missed that, okay? But the games happened so fast, Proof that he missed it, they suspended him for a game, right? Yeah. What about licking? <laughs> Pardon me? What about licking as a Boston fan? That's embarrassing. That's embarrassing. I, I, I love the Bruins, but when, Mac, when Marshall starts doing that, it's like, don't do that, you're taking away. But as a referee, when a player does that, and it happened last year, to show you how the human nature of referees, if you watch, and the Bruin fans can, can appreciate this, did Marchand get another call the rest of the playoffs last year after he pulled those stunts when he was embarrassing those referees? He was getting hooked on breakaways. The referees are going, yeah, that one's not going to be called. <laughs> Seriously, against Tampa Bay, if you watch those last two games when they got eliminated, Marchand had several chances where he was getting hooked. But the referees probably talked amongst themselves, watched some video, and said, that guy's going to have to work really, really hard to get a penalty out of us based on the way he's, because uh, there's no rule against, well, I guess they could have given him misconduct, but maybe they didn't see it, okay? But that was embarrassing. That was embarrassing, okay? Yes, sir? How much opportunity is there for a referee to be proactive, to have a sense that trouble is going to start and to try and uh, take some steps to avoid it, like the Example, you talked about face washing. So you have two teams going at it. Um, 
you know, the whistle goes, they're lining up for the face off, or they, they're doing the face wash thing, or they're jostling each other with the elbows. Is there an opportunity at that time to go to the coaches and to say, look, tell your players to knock it off. First guy that does it the next time is going to get a that it happens when there's no play in progress and all this stuff is going on in between the plays. You answered your own question very well. You, you do communicate with the coaches, but sometimes you take the guy who started it all. Okay, if it starts with a whack and then all the players are jumping in, you're going, I need to take somebody here. I need to send a message to these teams that we're not going to have scrums after every whistle. So you started this scrum, it lasted 30 seconds, but now we got all this stuff going on, you're going to the box. And the rest of the players go, okay, he's not just going to say you and you go, because there's no problem there. They're four on four. If you take one guy, that will send a clear message. Okay? But you use your voice too. Like you hear, now you see some referees, you know, they're, they're really yelling, hey, hey, that's enough, I'm, I'm going to take one, I'm going to take one, I'm going to take one. That usually gets guys stopping. A rule that was instituted, you'll notice that, uh, like, for those of you who don't know hockey super well, uh, you notice that the, the defensemen often stay back at the blue line, or they don't go past the hash marks when there's a scrum at the net. You go, how come those guys aren't helping their teammates out? Uh, the three guys, it's five on three, there's five guys, you know, face washing three guys there, how come they're not helping out? Well, the rule is what? <laughs> yeah, the minute those guys come past the, the dots, now the face-off goes outside. That rule was implemented to prevent five-on-five five scrums after the whistle. Is it still in force still in the in, NHL? Yeah. You'll see the, the linesmen often go like this, pointing out. So that's, that's good thinking. But you develop a, 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 a reputation as a referee, as someone who's going to put up with a lot of extracurriculars, or someone says, no, we're not going to have that kind of nonsense here. I was the kind of referee that probably to a fault sometimes didn't I wasn't I was a clean player so I really couldn't relate to a lot of the extracurricular stuff that guys did I remember doing a game in New York one time and a guy was on a breakaway and he scores and just after he sh lets go of the puck like but it was after the puck a guy a defensive comes and lunges and slashes him right across the arm okay the puck goes in the net after he shoots it, he gets whacked. The guy's in the corner, his arm is just like throbbing. The trainer has to come out, the guy's screaming in pain. I counted the goal, and I gave the guy a five minute major for slashing. While the coach was going nuts. How can you call that? He scored on the play. I went, no, he scored, then he was slashed. You don't know that. <laughs> 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 and sometimes they'll make you, you know, build, they, when, when 3,000 people are screaming at you and he's screaming at you going, maybe he's right, maybe, I, no, I saw that, I saw that happen, I saw shot, slash, that takes some nerve to make that call, a lot of guys won't make that call, they'll say, yeah, you know what, he scored, yeah, but he's not playing for the rest of the game now, and he got whacked pretty good, I should, so, that's the kind of referee I was, and I probably didn't go as far as I could have because people thought, yeah, I, he calls things a little bit too by the book sometimes. But I think you bring your own style sometimes to hockey. But players knew that I wasn't going to put up with that kind of stuff, so my games were pretty clean. I looked at my game sheets over the years, and I went, I didn't have a lot of brawls in my games. I had very few fights, okay? I didn't have lots of misconducts after people start saying, you know what, he's a good guy, he hustles, he communicates, he just doesn't put up with this extra stuff. But the, the UHL was a league that had players that weren't of AHL or AHL caliber. So a lot of these guys, a lot of these UHL cities, uh, I remember one of my first UHL games, two guys are squaring off and they're dancing, me being doing the IHL at the same time, where it was very professional, these guys are dancing five feet from each other, I jump in. And I take one guy away, the crowd was booing me. The guy went pulling away, he's going, what are you doing? I go, well, I'm saving you from a fight. He goes, but I want to fight. <laughs> I said, well, I don't want to see a fight. He says, but these people do. Yeah. So in that league, you literally sat there and, oh, boy. 
like I got pictures of me sitting there like this, and guys are dancing. I was like, I, I was watching this fight go on and going. But in the IHL, you would jump in and try to prevent it. In the NHL, you don't see fights anymore. Guys, the lines are getting there really quick. In the NH UHL, the lines are going to be holding you back sometimes. No, don't <laughs> let them go. Let them go. This is going to be good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hate it. I hate fighting. I still hate it to this day, but... Well, those are the guys that donated their brains to science. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. One question for you, Dad. Sure. When did you start in the, in the IHL? When did yeah. I start? <laughs> hmm. Sixty-something. Yeah, 1970. No, wait. Eighteen? <laughs> 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 Math teacher. <laughs> I would say it was around 60, 1965. Yeah. But, but that, that question that was asked by a lawyer was pretty damn good. You mentioned that. You should have uh, referees take some legal training in the summer. You guys are you taking the law in your own hands. You're not lawyers. That makes sense, doesn't it? Pay them accordingly. <laughs> when I first started, uh, a lot of the arenas did not have glass. That was the Chicken boards, water. which were maybe <laughs> six feet. Well, you go into Toledo on ten cent beer night. <laughs> man, my sweater at the end of the game just smelt like. Beer, oh, it was awful. It was awful. I mean, people would throw beer on you. But I enjoyed it. I didn't enjoy that part of it. I enjoyed officiating. And uh, it was nice talking to you people. And uh, hopefully we can do it again next year. God willing. <laughs> Sure. Would you want to give us a John last question? Sure, yeah, sure. Yes, sir. Uh, did you collect puck when you were uh, feeding from the Canadians? Yeah, I've got a lot of pucks. I've got five hundred kinds. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got a how 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 good is this thinking? Does anyone remember what color the original WHA pucks were? They were blue. What were they thinking? <laughs> I got that puck, a blue W. Does anyone here a puck collector? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm a hockey collector. And <laughs> <laughs> you collect I'm hockey, hockey. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a card? Yeah. Do you have a card? No. no. I also collected hats <laughs> <laughs> and, and jerseys. <laughs> There's a question back there, yes, sir. I, as, as an observer, I get the impression that uh, calling penalties for embellishing, that's going to be one of the hardest things to do. So how, how certain do you have to be? How much does the reputation of the player come into account? And how much of it is, well, I really have to call a penalty, but I, the score is tied. I don't want to... The, the game to be decided on that, so I'm going to call embellishment. The you only time I would call an embellishment call is to cover myself that in the event that I put my arm up too quickly. Okay? Sometimes the referee, you think a guy is hooking a guy, and you put your arm up, and he skates through the hook, and now you've got your arm up. <laughs> and the guy who was hooked flops, and you're going, it was a cheap hook, so I'm taking both of them. I got you for the hook, and I got you for the embellishment, and it's a brutal call. And you're 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 seeing the guys. I've said this to guys before. I've had my hand up like this, and I'm going, guys, if I could bite my arm off right now, I would, <laughs> but I can't. So you're going for uh, hooking, and you're going for embellishment, and give it to me on the way of the boss because I deserve it. And what are they going to say to you at that point? Okay, I've done that, but the embellishment thing, I, like my dad says. Why would you want to call it? The guy was taking himself out of the play. If he wants to take himself out of the play, let him. Right, Dad? I, I don't, personally don't like it. I don't like the call, but 
who am I? If I got fooled by a guy who yeah. who dove, yeah. I and and then I, I realized, geez, he dove, he got me, but I, I called the penalty. I'd, I'd let him know after. I'd say, well, next <laughs> time you might get hooked or you might get tripped purposely, and I'm not calling it. Yeah. So I let him know, okay, yeah. you got me that time, but hey, we make mistakes, we're human. Mm -hmm. I thought you, you mentioned by wanting to bite off your, your arm. <laughs> was, I re recall in, in the 80s, there was a game, a playoff game between the Islanders and, and the Canadians. And the, uh, Bruce Hood, who uh, we talked about earlier, uh, was refereeing it. And he raised his arm, and then he got knocked over by a player. And when he got back on, his arm didn't go back up. <laughs> well, we've all done the old. That's pretty bad. <laughs> just the helmets. <laughs> or, whoa, I was slip there. It's like, and the players pick it up. It's like, you had your arm up there. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? If you're, if you're doing this, uh, it's not a good habit. But John D'Amico, he was a good friend of my dad's. He always said, like, for offsides, like, a lot of, when you first start becoming a linesman, you you're, you got your, as the play's coming over the blue line, you're bringing your whistle up, anticipating, because I, wa I want to make that call as soon as it's offside, so everyone can say, God, that linesman is really on it. He says, watch me when I call offsides. I let the play happen. I say to myself, that was offside. Okay. He goes, that way you're not going to make, you're not going to blow it, because a few times, how many times have you seen a guy do this? Good. And they're going, you waved it off. <laughs> well, I waved it off prematurely because a lot of guys wanted to wave it off just as soon as they crossed the blue line so it looks like they're right on the game. <laughs> so here you are standing like this, and the player drags it along the blue line and puts himself offside. You're going, do I ever feel stupid <laughs> offside? And I'm gonna so, but it happens. You learn you learn little things like that. You say, okay, let, let the play happen. You're always evolving. Even the NHL guys will tell you. I've, I've used this line uh, on minor hockey league coaches who get a little bit perturbed sometimes in a nine-year-old game. They'll be, they'll be up in arms and they'll be, I go, can I talk to you between periods? Yeah, sure, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna settle this. <laughs> Let the rest of the period happen. Did you watch the NHL game last night? I'll say to the coach and he'll say, yeah, what about it? I said, I'm just, just bear with me here. Did you watch the NHL game last night? Yeah. Did you see that mistake the referee made in period two where they called a hook that wasn't, or he called a high stick where Crosby got high stick by his own guy, yet they called the Carolina guy for the high stick, and then Pittsburgh went and scored a power point? Yeah, I saw that. I said, do you know how much those referees are getting paid to do that game last night? About $5,000 US. And they made mistakes. I'm getting paid twenty-seven dollars Canadian, sir. Okay. I'm a school teacher. My linesman's an insurance agent, okay, and he is a lot a landscaper. He's making twenty-one dollars today. I said, we're allowed to make mistakes too. Well, I never thought about it that way. Says, we're doing the best we can. I don't care if Team A beats Team C. It's not a big thing to me. I'm doing the best I can, and uh, that usually puts me. And you get the coaches to say, especially in minor hockey, we're a team. Bob, you're the coach, I'm the ref. Let's make sure these kids have a good time today. You can't do that at the pro level, okay? But at the minor league, that's where you start to learn to have confidence, you learn communication skills. So when you do get higher up, you're, you're, you're ready for it, a little bit better prepared. And having a dad who could always give you some, good, some great advice. I want to thank both you guys for giving us your time tonight and your insight. Yeah, thank you for being good audience. Great questions. And thank you for uh, being attentive. And uh, I hope we sh gave you an appreciation for what uh, a referee goes through. Some of you already know that. If you ever have a, a son or a daughter who wants to referee, it's a it's a wonderful career. It's great for confidence building. It's a, it's a it's something that gets you out in the community. People recognize my dad and I uh, just because of our hockey and our teaching careers. We, we you know, came in contact with lots of people, but our hockey has opened lots of doors for us. And uh, if you have a, a female 
uh, you've got a daughter, uh, encourage her to, to think about refereeing. Uh, you, you, need, you have to have thick skin. Okay, like someone said over there, 50% of the people are going to love what you're doing, 50% of the people are not going to like what you're doing. And you have to, and you have to live with that. But I'm telling you, it's a, it's a great, great thing for your confidence. And you get paid too. Like there's not a lot of part-time jobs that will pay you to do what a referee does. Okay, so it's worth uh, investigating and encouraging. And thank you for your uh, your attendance today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.